we'd encourage you to check out our Facebook page for any announcements or upcoming events. You can also follow us on Instagram. We are live streaming the message each week, which is uploaded to YouTube that you can share with your friends and watch from anywhere at any time. You can give of your tithes and offerings at crosscurrent.org. If you click on the more tab there, you will see the giving option. You can also text an amount to 703-972-1748. Good morning, Cross Parent Church. Welcome back for another Sunday service online. My name is Jessica Klotwijk, and I'm the Director of Women's Ministry here at Cross Current Church. We're glad you're here to worship with us. We're going to have some singing, and then we'll jump into our message. We're glad you're here. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Let's um, stand up together and um, worship our Lord together as one. of the Son of Man, the stories of the Savior, and holiness with human hands, the treasure for the traitor, no ear has heard, oh, no ear has heard, no eye has seen. Image of the Father until heaven came to live with me, a rescue like no other. Let's lift our voices. You are worthy. Come on, you are.
turn your attention towards the screen, and you may now be seated. Oh, well, how's everyone doing this evening? Yeah? Oh, good. Well, I want to invite you back to your feet again and stand up. We're going to continue in our worship to the Lord tonight, Lord, and just singing his praises, singing about who he is and what he's done for us in our lives. And I just want to read a scripture before we get right into it. Um, you know, John chapter 14, the gospel of John, right? Jesus is telling his disciples that he's about to go the road of the cross, right? Where I'm going, you can't come. And that's a lot of big, that's big news for disciples, right? Because disciples' job was to follow their rabbi. And he's saying, I'm leaving. You know, so Thomas says in verse what is it, 17, here's what Thomas says, well, where, where are you going? Like, how will we know the way? And Jesus says those famous words, I am the way, I am the truth, all right? I'm the life, all right? No one can come to the Father except through me. And that's what we need to hear in this day and age, in this, in this culture, in this world. There's so many ways to the good life. But we turn to Jesus tonight and say, no, you are that way, Lord. We want your way. We want your truth, Jesus. We want the life that you can bring about in us. And so we got a new song for you tonight. It's really simple. It's just right out of John 14 there it goes. And I believe you are the way, the truth, and the life. And I believe you are the way, the truth.
our way truth and life to me. Become our way truth and life. We trust you. We place our trust in you, God.
Hello, everyone. Happy New Year. Welcome to Cross Current. My name is Fraser. I'm the senior pastor here. If you have a Bible or you have it on your phone, pull it out, turn to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Uh, one of the greatest gifts that God has given you is the freedom to choose. Uh, that's what makes you different from the animals. You have a free moral choice. The problem with that greatest gift that we've been given is in some ways it's also our greatest curse because with that freedom to choose, we make stupid choices all the time. Every choice that I make is not a good one and neither is yours. And so sometimes we waste that power that God gave us. Sometimes I like to talk about it as your responsibility. I say that God has given you a response ability. You have an ability to respond. And so you have a responsibility to your response ability. Now, every year in January, uh, people make these new choices. And we call them New Year's resolutions. And the problem with so many New Year's resolutions are that we make them about trivial things. And we set out to accomplish them by willpower. And willpower is of some use, but it only goes so far. And so for most of us, we'll set some new goal or some new task or some new habit, and we'll set out by willpower, and I'll give you till maybe the end of February at best. So what I want us to do today is I want us to look at the four most important resolutions that you can make in your life. And these are far from trivial. These are life-shaping resolutions. And so what I'm going to share with you today is that, that if, you t if you were to make these four resolutions tonight and depend on God to help you, your life will radically improve. And not just this next year, but for the rest of your life. I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about this man in the Bible called Moses. 
And Moses is regarded as the greatest man in the Old Testament part of the Bible. Moses was the man who led the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, after 400 years of being slaves. He's the man who led them out to freedom. Moses was the man who challenged the greatest nation of the world at the time. Egypt basically ruled the whole known world. Moses was the man who challenged it. He's the man who challenged Pharaoh, the king at the time, and he's the man who led free over, people estimate, between one and two million people. If you're still not familiar, Moses is the guy who God gave the Ten Commandments to. Moses is the guy who wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, also known as the Torah. So the question is, what? What was it about him? Why did God choose Moses to be the greatest man in the Old Testament? And I think it's because Moses made four resolutions, four choices that set his destiny. And these are the same things that can change your life. You see, you have to come to this realization that what is most important in life is not nearly what happens to you, but the choices that you make. So many people think that the importance of life is the things that happen, but it's not. It's the choices that you make. We make our choices, and then our choices make us. Your character is the sum total of the choices that you make. And so while you don't control all of your circumstances, you control your choices. So if you're in Hebrews 11, or if you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can pull up the notes to follow along and be on the screen as well. In Hebrews chapter 11, there are just five verses here about the life of Moses. The very first verse is about the choice that his parents make for him. And then the next four verses are the choices that he made for himself. Have you heard of Pharaoh? Pharaoh uh, had decided that the Jews were going to, were getting too large in number. And he was worried about them rising up. And so Pharaoh made this decree that all the baby boys were to be murdered. Are you familiar with that story? It's another part of the Bible that sometimes they leave out in the cartoons is that actually they were killing all the children, the little baby boys. And the Bible tells us that Moses' parents decided, we're not going to do that. We're not going to kill our born son. And so we believe this is a special child. We believe God has a plan and purpose for his life. And so rather than murdering their baby boy, the story says that he was put into a basket and they put the basket onto the river Nile. And they shoved him down a bit to a spot in the river where Pharaoh's daughter was down bathing. Pharaoh's daughter sees uh, this basket. She falls in love with this little newborn baby and she decides to take that baby home and adopt him as her son. And so now this baby uh, slave child becomes the grandson of the Pharaoh. So let's read this uh, script together from Hebrews 11, and here it is also on the screen. It says this. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child. And they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he chose instead to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ of greater value than all the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward in heaven. And so by faith he left Egypt not fearing the king's anger, and he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. 
in this passage, there are four verbs that I want to point out. It says, Moses, it says, by faith, Moses, here it is, number one, is refused. He refused. Number two, Moses chose. Number three, Moses regarded. And number four, Moses persevered. He refused something. He chose something. He regarded something. And he persevered in something. These are the four things that I want us to look at tonight. And these are four resolutions that I want you to make for your own life. And so if you're taking notes, you can write these down. And here's the first one. Number one, my first resolution is this. I refuse to be defined by others. I refuse to be defined by others. Listen to me, friends. God did not make you to be what somebody else wants you to be. God didn't make you to be what your parents want you to be, what your girlfriend or your boyfriend wants you to be, what your spouse wants you to be. God didn't make you to be what your boss wants you to be or what your peers want you to be. God made you to be the you that he made you to be. And if you are going to become all that you can be, not just in 2021, but for the remainder of your life, you have to deal with this issue. And this is actually the first issue that Moses had to deal with. Let's look at the verse again. It's verse 24, Hebrews 11, verse 24. It says, by faith, Moses, when he'd grown up, look at this, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused to be defined by what other people said about him. Now you think about this for a second. Moses must have had an identity crisis. Because as I explained to you earlier, he was actually born to one of the Hebrew women, to the, the Jewish, the Israelite woman. But he was raised Egyptian. And not just Egyptian, Egyptian royalty. And so as he grows up, he, he's got to decide, like, who am I? And that's going to affect the rest of his life. So Moses has these two choices. On the one hand, he can pretend to be Pharaoh's grandson for the rest of his life, and he can live a life of luxury. He can have fame, and he can be, have fortune. He can have, he can have all the treasures that he could possibly want in the world. He'll be a celebrity. He'll have power and prestige and status. Or he can realize who he really is. He's Jewish. And by realizing who he is, perhaps they will kick him out. And he's going to live with the slaves the rest of his life. And he's going to be disgraced. And he's going to be humiliated. And he's going to have to live a life of pain and sorrow and drudgery. Which one would you do? And so Moses refuses to live a lie. Because he's a man of integrity. But when I think about it, most people today are living lies. Most people are trying to be people that they're not. Trying to impress people about things that really just aren't true in your life. And can I tell you something? When you do that, that creates enormous internal anxiety. Incredible internal stress to keep trying to be something that you're not really, not truthfully, not honestly. And it tells us that Moses insisted on being who God made him to be and not pretending to be something else. Here's my first question for you tonight Who are you letting determine your identity? Your friends? Your parents, your family. Look, some of you, you have parents that died years ago and you still hear their voices in your mind. And you're trying to live up to this life that they wanted for you. Some of you are still trying to live a life that, that your, uh, your ex-husband or your ex-wife said about you and, uh, and you're trying to prove them wrong. And so they've got control of your life. Some of you are trying to impress people. You're living a life of the culture, keeping up with the Joneses, 
trying to impress people that you don't even like. Social media, what culture in the world tells you you're supposed to be like, what your competition says. Who is, a, who is telling you who you are? Let me show you another verse from the Bible. This is from Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 in the New Testament. And it tells us this. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. But let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good. Do you see this verse is about the two, the two things that are trying to shape you? He says, don't get squeezed into the mold of the world that's trying to make you into something, but instead prove that God's plan for your life is good by being shaped by him. But here's the problem. You don't know the plan of God, do you? But it starts by refusing to be squeezed. You know, elsewhere in the Bible, it tells us, don't follow the crowd in doing wrong. In other words, don't let peer pressure push you into things that you don't want to do. Don't let people make you act like someone that you're not. They don't really like you anyway. Those people that you're trying to impress, they don't really care about you anyway. Look what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. He says about our purpose. He says our purpose is to please God, not people. He, that's God, he is the one who examines the motives of our hearts. You know, Jesus prays this prayer one time in John chapter 17. Not, not the Lord's prayer, but a prayer that he prays for us. And one of the things is in John 17 of his prayer, he says, he says of his disciples, they are not defined by this world. They are no, he says, they are no more defined by this world than I am defined by this world. Is that true for you? Could Jesus say about you tonight, could Jesus say to the Father, that son of mine at Cross Current Church, that daughter of mine at Cross Current Church, you see them? They are not defined by the world. This is so important that we, we have to deal with this one first because when you know who you are, it sets you free from the fear of disapproval. One of the most remarkable stories of Jesus is in that, in that last night when he's with the disciples in the upper room. And do you know that story just before the Last Supper where he washes their feet? There's a verse there that, that, that blows me away. It says, Now Jesus, knowing that the Father had put all things under his power, took off his clothing, put on a towel and a basin and washed their feet. But it's that first part. Now Jesus knowing that the Father had put all things under his... See, Jesus knew who he was. He knew his identity and therefore it was no trouble for him to take on the role of a servant and wash people's feet because he knew who he was. And when you know who you are in Jesus Christ, you don't fear disapproval of other people. You don't care what people think because... Because, like, here's what happens. It's like one of two things. Basically, basically, envy says, I must be like you to be happy. That's envy. I got to be like you to be happy. But then the other one is this people pleasing, which says, I must be liked by you to be happy. And both of those are so wrong. Both of those things will keep you from fulfilling a life of happiness. You have to say, you know what? No, I'm going to resolve that I will refuse to be defined by other people. I'm not going to let other people approve of me or disapprove of me. Only what God says about me is what matters. And that's what Moses did. And that's your first life-shaping resolution. No more will I let other people press me into the remote. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, a famous verse, it says this of God. It says, I know the plans that I have for you. And they are plans for good and not for disaster. 
to give you a future and a hope. That's real success. Real success, not phony or fake or, or artificial success. Real success is a life being exactly who you were created to be and nothing more than that. And I want that for you. I want that as your pastor. I want that for you. I want that for me to become more whole people, to live the rest of our life out of our most authentic self and not the peer pressure of expectation. Here's the second resolution, number two. The second thing God wants you to do, number two, is I choose short-term pain for long-term gain. Anyone who's ever played sports uh, knows this one. That you've got to put in the effort beforehand. You've got to put in the practice. You've got to, put in, you've got to work hard. You've got to put in some sweat. You, 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 just, you don't just show up to the championship game. You don't just walk into the championship game. No pain, no gain. What you put out, you get back. If you're going to be good at anything, you've got to put out some short-term pain to get some long-term gain. And that's not just true in sports. That's true in finances. That's true in relationships. It doesn't come easy, right? Think of it. Nobody just had an easy relationship. Nobody. You got to work to make it work. It takes work to make it work. So you got to put out some short term pain in order to get some long term gain. Now, why is this resolution so important in your life? It's because most of the problems in your life come from your inability to delay gratification. Am I speaking the truth? Everything in society teaches us, right, that. I want everything and I want it now. And I want it free and I want it easy. <laughs> life isn't like that. And so almost every problem in your life comes from your inability to put off pleasure in order to get a longer amount of it later on. So here's how we all want things. We want it quick, we want it free, and we want it easy. Think about this, quick, free, and easy. And the truth is that in life, there are some things where you can get two of those three things. Right? There are some things you can get quick and easy, but they're not free. There's some things you can get quick and free, but they're not easy. There are some things you can get easy and free, but they won't be quick. But you can't get anything quick, easy, and free. The reason that you're in debt is because you have an inability to delay gratification. That's why you're in debt. Because you see it and you want it. You don't have the money for it. You can't afford it. So I'll charge it to the credit card. Because rather than delay gratification and get it later when I can't afford it, I want it now. And then you're in debt. And deeper in debt. The reason that America is falling off the fiscal cliff is because our government doesn't know how to delay gratification. We want it all, and we want it now, even though we can't pay for it. So it's true in finances. You know, it's also true in your physical health. <laughs> It's like, it's like people, they don't want to put in the effort to, to, to have good health with exercise and proper diet and getting the right amount of sleep. We just want to do whatever feels good. And then we'll pay for it later. <laughs> it's just, it's this strange irony where it's like we sacrifice our health all through our working life to make money. To then spend that money trying to get our health back when we're older. <laughs> it's also true in relationships. People say, oh, I don't want to follow God's plan when it comes to relationships. I don't want to follow God's, what God says about sex. I, I want to have it now. I'm not married, but it doesn't matter. 
And then it causes all kinds of problems. Because you know, when you have sex with someone, you give them a piece of your heart. And it always costs you something. There's an emotional attachment and you're giving yourself away. It causes spiritual problems. Look, would you agree with me that usually the right thing to do is not always the easy thing to do? Isn't that true? In fact, the easy thing is typically the wrong thing to do. The right thing to do is usually the hard thing. You know, if somebody hurts me, the easy thing to do is to hurt them back. But the right thing to do is to forgive them. But that's not easy. And it's not painless. Here's what happened to Moses. Let's look back at our main verses here. Because Moses has a choice. And if you look at verse 25, it tells us about his choice. It says this, Moses chose. All right, underline that. Moses chose. Now, what did he choose? To be mistreated. Now, that's painful. To be mistreated is painful. And yet it tells us he chose the way of pain. Along with the people of God, in other words, he, he went to be with the slaves, rather than to enjoy the pleasures of, of sin for a short time. And this is, this is what I love about the Bible, that it always tells the truth. It doesn't gloss over anything, right? In this verse, it says that rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Can we all just have a moment of confession right now? Sin is fun. Sin's fun. That's why we do it. If sin was painful, we wouldn't do it. We do sin because it's fun. And that's what the Bible says. That there is a certain pleasure to be had in sin. And the Bible admits that. It's pleasurable to break the law. It's pleasurable to eat too much. It's pleasurable to party and sleep with whoever you want, drink what you want, smoke whatever you want. And it's pleasurable to be your own boss and be where, go wherever you want. And, I mean, it's fun. Of course it is. But notice it says, for a short season. You can go out and have your kicks, but it always has a kickback. Always. And the lie that we believe and the trap that we fall into every time is that it'll be okay. Just this one time. Nobody will know. I'm not hurting anybody. But there's always a kickback. And so it says of Moses that he chose not to have the pleasures of sin. He says he chose to be mistreated. He chose the short-term pain for the long-term gain. It's interesting in verse 23... It says that God chose Moses when he was a baby. So there's this part where God chose him. But then in verse 24, it says Moses had to choose God. God chose Moses, but Moses had to choose God. Listen to me. God has chosen you. Every single one of you here tonight and everyone watching me online, God has chosen you. Have you chosen him? In verse 24, we see Moses refusing. And in verse 25, we see Moses choosing. You see, the negative is always followed by the positive. And so before you make resolutions, you may have to make some disillusions. Refusing, then choosing. You know, the Christian life is not just a matter of refusing. Some people think that Christianity is a life of don'ts. A bunch of, a bunch of rules of no's. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't cuss, don't chew, don't go with girls who do. You know what? If the Christian life was about a bunch of things that you don't do, then anybody who was dead would be saved because they don't do anything. No, Christianity is I refuse this and I choose this. The negative is followed by 
the positive. Now, did you notice earlier when I said that when he had grown up, he refused and he chose? He did the refusing and the choosing when he had grown up. Why is that? Because this is a mark of maturity. This is a mark of responsibility. So my question to you is, where do you need to start accepting responsibility for your own life? Who are you blaming for your unhappiness? Well, if I just had a different wife, then I'd be happy. Really? If I just, if I just had grown up in a different family, then I'd be happy. Really? If, if, if I could just get married, I'd be happy. If I could just have a kid, then I'd be happy. If I could just find a job, then I'd be happy. Who are you blaming? Who are you blaming for your unhappiness? Because you are as happy as you choose to be. Because happiness is a choice. And by the way, so is being close to God. That's a choice too. You are as close to God as you choose to be. If you're not close to God, guess who moved? God didn't move. God wants more than anything to be close to you. If you're not close to God, it's because you have chosen not to be close to God. You got to make the choice. Now, the fact is, it says that when he had grown up, he refused something and he chose something. When are you going to grow up? I mean, when are you going to grow up? I'm going to save some people tonight thousands of dollars in marriage counseling fees. Right now, here it comes. Grow up! Just grow up. Stop being so selfish. Stop blaming everybody else for your life. I can't tell you how many guys, men that I've talked to, maybe we're playing golf or, and it's like, I'm saying to them, in a roundabout way, I'm saying to them, dude, when are you going to take responsibility for your life? (laughs) Because men, we're basically just big children. Just kids and bigger bodies. And I'm like, dude, when are you going to take responsibility for your life? And I've heard guys say things to me like, well, my my wife's a committed Christian. (laughs) I'm like, so? So what? You think that, that that's going to give you some ticket into heaven because your wife is a committed Christian? Of course not. You need to man up and make your own commitment. It says, when Moses had grown up, it says he he started accepting responsibility for his own life. Have you done that? You can't blame anybody else for the direction of your life. If your life sucks, it's because you're choosing for it to suck. So, am I being clear enough? <laughs> Let me be real clear. <laughs> Look, I, I know, I admit, we're all products of our past. Me too. We're products of our past, but we're not prisoners to our past. Did I get an amen? Of course your past has influenced you, but it doesn't control you. And I know that other people have hurt you And I know that other people will hurt you. And they will. And I'm sorry about that. Other people can hurt you. Other people can scar you. Other people can harm you. But nobody can ruin you. Except yourself. Only you can ruin yourself. But if you will do the hard thing right now. If you'll choose short-term pain now in exchange for long-term gain. I want to talk to some of our younger people tonight who are here. Listen up. Students, 
kids, young people. You can choose pain now or pain later. All the parents, come with me. I'm helping you here. Maybe your parents have told you what I'm about to tell you, but I'm a different voice. And I'm a different authority. Let me just try and give you some old, bald guy wisdom, right? (laughs) If you will do the hard things now, if you'll put in the effort now, if you discipline yourself to learn, to grow, to become strong, to become mature, and do some hard things now that you don't want to do, you will benefit from them for the rest of your life. If you're a teenager and you do the easy things first, you're going to have the hard stuff later. And life will be hard the rest of your life. If you goof off in school and you don't learn and you don't grow and you don't accept responsibility, you'll have a hard life the rest of your life. But if you take the choice of pain now and do what's hard and forsake some choices that everyone else is doing and put it in now, you'll have a great rest of your life. I wonder if we could have just a moment of vulnerable honesty. I wonder if there's any adults who, you don't have to say anything, but would put their hand up and say, I wish I had tried harder when I was a kid. Would anyone, I mean, I know some of you are awesome and you're high flyers and you aced it all the way. Look at that. That's like a lot of people. Because wouldn't life have been a bit easier later if you'd done a bit more earlier. (laughs) There are a couple of promises from God about pain. Look at this in Romans 5 verse 3. It says, we can have joy in our troubles because we know that these troubles produce patience and patience produces character and character produces hope. See, if we can just find a way to enjoy the pain in the present, we can have the power of the future. The second thing that God has promised is that he will reward me for the pain that I go through. Look at this in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. It says, these present troubles, right? Studying and getting your papers done on time. These current struggles of of foregoing extra chocolate and going to the gym. These current current troubles of premarital counseling. These current troubles of saving and investing and not overspending. He says these current troubles are quite small and they won't last very long, right? You're not in school forever. You don't have to go to counseling and therapy forever. You don't have to, to, to forego buying a nice thing forever. It says Yet they will produce, they will produce, it says, something of an immeasurable great glory that will last forever. An eternal benefit for short-term struggle. Why am I going through these troubles? Why am I going through this pain? Why am I going through this trial? The reason is because God cares more about your character than your comfort. And God cares more about your holiness than your happiness. God is not the inventor of the American dream. Sorry. God has a heavenly dream that far surpasses anything that this earth can offer you. So I got to choose to not be defined by other people and I got to choose short-term gain, pain for long-term gain. And the third thing I choose that Moses chose, number three, is I have to choose God's values and not the world's. I choose God's value for my life, not what the world wants to give me as values. We made our way to verse 26 of our passage. Hebrews 11, verse 26. It says, Moses regarded. Now, what does that mean? 
Regarded means to evaluate. It means to consider. It means to, to kind of weigh in the balances, right? To make a value judgment. And it says that he regarded that disgrace for the sake of Christ. I remember the first time I read this verse. I mean, genuinely so. This is not preacher talk. I genuinely remember the first time I read this verse. And I was like, what the heck is he talking about? He didn't know anything about Jesus. I mean, unless I got all my Bible mixed up. But like Moses was way back in the Bible, wasn't he? And it says that Moses regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ. That's weird, isn't it? And he regarded that as of greater value. Now that's a value judgment. You get the idea of weighing things, right? You got something in each hand and you're making a, a judgment, a values judgment. And he says, it says here that he considered it of greater value than all the treasures of Egypt. Moses was the, was the grandson of Pharaoh. Now, why? How was he able to do that? It says, because he was looking ahead to his reward. Long-term gain for short-term pain. He's making a value judgment and he's clarifying what matters most. So uh, I've been asking you questions and I'm getting in your face, so I'm just going to keep going. What are your values? What matters most to you in life? Here's a little exercise. What are the top three values in your life? Don't say them out loud, but name them to yourself. What are your top three values? Go. Because if you can't name them, you can't live them. <laughs> That's it. If you can't name your values, how are you going to live them out? Integrity. Honesty. And generosity. Can't name them, you can't live them. It says, Moses chose God's values over the world's values. Now, why is this so important? I'll tell you why. It's a little secret. Everybody lean in a little closer. It's a little secret. I'll whisper it into the microphone. Here we go. <laughs> if you don't decide what's important in your life, other people are going to decide for you. Shh. You've got to decide what's important in your life and then live by those values. Moses here, it says, Moses is like, I am not going to live by the world's values. Now, what are the world's values? They're the same ones that the world has valued throughout history. I'm going to show you this. I love this. I get excited by the Bible. And what I'm going to show you, I just love this. This is like, it just opens up so many things. What we're going to see here in the story of Moses is the exact same three values that the world is built on. The exact same three things that every advertisement on TV is built upon. You ready? Here they are. Passion, possession, position. I'll say it another way. Sex, salary, and status. Or what the Bible calls the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Friends, they have not changed in thousands and thousands of years. It's the same thing that the serpent tried to get Adam and Eve with. It's the same thing that the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness with. The same three things. And here in the life of Moses, what's this? It's the same three things. Pop the slide up. In verse 24, we see that the, the world values popularity, right? That's what TikTok's all about. That's what Instagram's all about. It's about being popular. It's about being famous. It's about having celebrity. In verse 25, we see that the world values pleasure. If it feels good, can't be that bad. Pleasure, enjoyment, satisfaction, hedonism. And in verse 26, 
possessions, the treasures of Egypt, new car, new house, nice clothes, great vacations, great restaurants. I want to look good and I want to feel good and I want to have the goods. I want to be famous. I want to be rich and I want to have fun. That's the world's value system. But you know what? It's ironic. It's so ironic, as Alanis Morissette once said. It's ironic. Because you know what? Moses' standards, by Moses' standards, he had it made. He was in Pharaoh's house. He would have had all those things. There would have been no one else wealthier in the world. There would have been nobody more important. And he walks away from that He walks away from the American dream. He walks away from what most people spend their entire lives trying to get. Why? Because he knew what you have yet to realize is that it doesn't last. 1 John 2 verse 17 says, The world and everything in it that people desire is passing away. But those who do the will of God live forever, short-term pain for long-term gain. So listen, if the wise way is to live not by the world's value system, but by God's value system, what does God value? What does he value? (laughs) It's all in the story. These three verses of Moses tell us the three things that God values. And if you're using notes, you can write these down too. The first one is that God's purpose is more valuable than popularity. God's purpose, diving into God's purpose for your life, that's far more important than being popular. Because as Pharaoh's grandson, don't you think Moses was pretty popular? Don't you th- Moses would have been the heir to the throne, presumably at some point. He was celebrity. Moses would be a young playboy in today's world. He'd be, on ba- he'd be the bachelor. He's famous. Hey, does anyone here remember who was on the cover of, um, of People magazine last month? No, you don't, and that's the point. Neither did I. Nobody even remembers who was on the cover last month. I'm a huge golf fan. Who was second at the Masters this year? Anyone? Me neither. I forgot. No one remembers. <laughs> I was talking to this guy at the gym. Big guy. Must be there every day. Very impressive. Lifts a lot of weight. <laughs> and he was, well, first of all, I was eavesdropping. I'll just, let me, let's be honest. Let's get this story off on the right footing. I was eavesdropping. And this guy was older than me, like 20. And... (laughs) Now, he was like 50, easily 50. (laughs) A little older. And he was telling his friend stories in which he was living off of his high school days. (laughs) This guy was 50 years old. And the highest moment of his life was when he was on the high school football team. (laughs) Now, I wasn't about to tell him because he was really big, but... I kind of wanted to say to him, you know everyone else in your high school year, do you think they care about you now? (laughs) You can see why I didn't ask him that. But you get these people walking around campus. Maybe those of you who have teenagers, they'll tell you about kids in their year and they say, she's one of the popular girls. Right? Right? And they walk around campus, guys and girls, cool and popular. And that's the highest achievement they'll ever make in life. And the people that you live to please, 
You'll never see them again. I can tell you, I'm not friends with anyone I went to school with. Like, there's one or two I could call them if I go home and get a game of golf. I'm not friends with anyone I went to school with. But in school, man, it felt really important. But God's purpose for you is so much more important than whether you're popular. The second thing that God values, number two, he says people are more valuable than pleasure. Moses decides that that freeing these slaves, these one to two million men, women, and children, that it's more important than living the luxury in in Pharaoh's palace. You follow me with this logic? He decides that freeing these people from their suffering was more important to him than him enjoying the pleasure. And so he trades his royal lifestyle to help the neediest people. Many of you gave money this Christmas. Many of you gave money this Christmas to feed needy families. You could have bought a widescreen TV with that money. You could have gone out for another meal. You could have bought yourself another outfit. But you gave up something of your pleasure to give to people who had need. And I want to tell you, God saw that. God noticed that. You valued people over the pleasure of things that you could buy. And sometimes what happens is people are going to, people are going to go, why did you sacrifice money that you could have spent on personal pleasure to go help somebody, most of whom you don't even know? Why would you do that? And the answer is we value God's value system that says that people are more important than pleasure. The number three thing, the third value of God is that peace of mind is more valuable than possessions. I moved here from Scotland to this place called Ashburn. I remember the first time I stuck it into Google. Ashburn, Virginia. Like, let's see what it's about. First thing that came up. If you've never been to Ashburn, Your data probably has. That's the first thing that came up. Told me all about data centers and all the stuff around here. One of the next things I learned, Ashburn. Wealthiest income county in America. Whoa. A lot of money in data. Came here, moved here, met people, live among people. Meet church people, meet people at the gym, meet people at the store, meet the parents of other kids at school. Here's what I've discovered. You can have a house stuffed full of possessions. But if there's antagonism in your home, if there's anger, if there's disappointment, if there's discouragement in your house, then all your peace of mind is gone. And yet peace of mind is so much more valuable than possessions. Where do you get peace of mind? Where do you get it? From being in the will of God. From knowing you're in the will of God. You know what? Advertisements, they lie to you. Advertisements tell you that you can buy peace of mind. (laughs) Get insurance and you'll have peace of mind. Get a safety deposit box, you'll have peace of mind. Get a lock, get, get cameras for your house, get... You can have peace of mind. You can't buy peace of mind. (laughs) Buy this thing and get happiness. Every time you buy a new car, right? Or you you buy an iPad or you get a new video game. It's like, you love it. It's so good. (laughs) For a while. But after a while, it sort of wears off. It's not, as, it's not as fun as it was once. Now, why, why, do you know why that happens? There are a couple of things. Now, in psychological terms, it's called habituation. But let me put it in real world terms. It's because things change. No. It's because people change and things don't. That's the best way of putting it. People change and things don't. So we get bored with things that don't change. That's why you have to redecorate. 
Husbands, let me tell you what's going on in your wife's mind. It's why they have to redecorate. <laughs> By the way, if you're new here, I'm what's called an equal opportunities offender, which means I try to make sure I upset everybody at some point. <laughs> We've got to redecorate that piece of art that you bought that was like so wonderful after a few years. You're like, nah, can we change this? It says, Moses gave up what everybody else spends their lives trying to get. Success, fame, power, money, and all that stuff. Why did he do it? Look at that last part of the verse. It says, he was looking ahead to his reward. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Vision sets values. Vision sets values. What you're looking at will determine what you value. And so if you will keep your eyes on Jesus, that's what you'll value. If you keep your eyes on eBay and Amazon, that's what you'll value. All right, the last one is short and then I'm done. Number four, the fourth value. The fourth uh, resolution is this. I choose to live by faith rather than fear. These are the four res resolutions. And if you will make this one, <laughs> this will change your life dramatically. Stop living out of fear and start living in faith. Where do we, where do we get to? Verse 27, I think. Hebrews 11, verse 27. It says, by faith, not by fear, it says, by faith, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. I circled the word faith and the phrase not fearing. Because basically, you're going to live by one or the other. You're either going to live by faith or you're going to live by fear. Moses goes to the most powerful man in the world and he says, hey Pharaoh, you know those slaves that you have, the ones that are building all your pyramids? I'm taking them. <laughs> Can you imagine it? Hey, I'm taking them. All those guys working for you, working for free, building all your stuff, making you rich and famous, I'm taking them and we're all leaving. We're packing up and we're leaving and you're not going to stop us. Let my people go. <laughs> you think Moses had a reason to be fearful? Of course he does. He's coming up against the most powerful man in the world and telling him he's taking all his stuff. And Pharaohs in those days were basically considered to be God. You know, I'd read a little in my research, basically whatever Pharaoh said you had to do. If Pharaoh said cut off your arm, you had to cut off your arm. If Pharaoh said murder your wife, you had to murder your wife. Like whatever Pharaoh says you did. And he marches in and he says, those people, I'm taking them, we're leaving. And Pharaoh basically, to put it in modern language, says, you and who else? You ever say that when you were in an argument? You and whose army? <laughs> Pharaoh's like, oh, really? Sure you are. And this is what happens. Moses says, I'm not afraid of you. Because I report to a higher authority. You see, the closer you get to God, the less you will have fear in your life. The further you get from God, the more fear will fill your life. How many of you are starting 2021 full of fear? It's because you're far from God. I can't overemphasize to you the importance of faith. You know, the Bible says, that, it says, whatever is not of faith is sin. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Can I, can I give you a little, a, little, a little help when it comes to, to prayers? Listen, God does not, answer your complaints. God does not respond to whining. It's like people just, it's like they don't get this. God does not respond to complaining and whining. In fact, here's a deeper thought. Is there anyone here tonight who can go a little bit deeper? Nobody. Okay. Someone over here. Someone. Here, here it is. Is, is. is it for you? 
for the person who wants a little deeper thought, here we go. God does not answer prayers based on need. He answers prayers based on purpose. Did this say you get that? Did you get that over here? God does not answer prayers based on need. There's always need. Everyone has need. Why do some people get their prayers answered and others don't? They have need. Everyone has need. Jesus didn't heal every single sick person that he came into contact with. But they all had need. God works according to purpose. And the currency by which that is activated is faith. And all your whining and sniveling and complaining about your circumstances isn't moving God's attention one bit. You've got to give God something to work with, and that is faith. Everyone has faith. You know even atheists have faith. You can't live in the world without faith. You came in this room and you had faith that if you sat on that seat, it would hold you up. When you get in your car and you drive from here, you're going to come up to a, an intersection and there'll be red lights stopping the other cars and you're going to have faith that they're going to abide by the law so that you can pull out in that intersection. Everybody has faith. It's not that you have faith, it's who you put it in. And the key is to put it in Jesus Christ. You know, there are people who live their life in fear that they're afraid of rejection. You need to live in faith and not in fear. You need to say, I'm not going to let fear dominate my life. I'm going to live with faith. And I'm going to not put that faith in myself. I'm going to put that faith in Jesus Christ. And if you will put your faith in somebody else, you're going to be severely disappointed. Boyfriend, girlfriend, president of the United States, doesn't matter. Because everybody will let you down eventually, except Jesus. Our last verse and then we'll pray and the band could start to get ready. But the Bible says in Galatians 2, it says, no one can please God by simply obeying the law. Why? Because we're not perfect. So we put our faith in Jesus Christ and God accepted us because of our faith. I want to ask you tonight as we start this year, have you done that? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? And if you haven't, you need to do that and you need to do it right now. Would you all bow your heads before the Lord and close your eyes for a second and I want to pray. As we begin this new year together, I'm urging you to make these four life-changing resolutions and to ask God's Spirit to give you the power to keep them. So as I pray this prayer, I want you to follow me in it and just in your heart just say, me too, God, me too. Say, dear God, as I begin this year, I don't just want to drift through it, but to move with direction and purpose. And so today, like Moses, I commit to these four life-changing resolutions. The first one, with your help, is that I resolve to not let other people define me anymore. I want to be what you made me to be. The second thing is that I choose short-term pain in order to have long-term gain. Help me to do the right thing. Thirdly, I resolve to live by your values and not the world's values. And finally, I resolve to live the rest of my life as best as I know how, by faith and not by fear. And Father, I realize that only by your grace and your power can I keep these commitments. And so Jesus Christ, I put my faith in you today. I ask you to save me, to empower me and help me and guide me. And I want to stop making excuses and take responsibility. In Jesus' name.
are so good, so great, and we worship you tonight. Jesus, Son of God, the one who calls us out of the darkness into your light, the only one who can do that, who calls us away from our bondage, whatever demons are trying to run our life, Lord, we, we submit to you tonight, Jesus, in your kingdom, in your way, in your power in our lives, for it is good. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name and in your power and in your kingdom we go out today. We say, amen. Thanks for joining us tonight. I oh, mean, what a what an awesome night, guys! Just worshiping and and hearing truth, and Lord, let us be challenged by that tonight. The chase after Jesus, pursue Him in all areas of our life. So yeah, have a great night, and yeah, see you next week. Thank you for being part of our service today. We hope that you got something special out of that. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you back here online or on Saturdays at 6 p.m. you